Nearly everything we've covered in this course thus far, and more still to come, describe aspects of thinking. Generally speaking, we can define thinking as any mental activity or processing of information. It includes learning, remembering, perceiving, communicating, believing, and deciding. All are fundamental aspects of what psychologists call cognition. As we discovered in a previous module, behaviorists attempted to explain mental activity in terms of stimulus and response, reinforcement and punishment. Yet psychologists have long known that our minds often go beyond the available information, making leaps of insight and drawing inferences. Our minds fill in the gaps to create information that isn't present in its current environment. So basically, thinking is the processing of information to solve problems and make judgments and decisions. Why do we bother to engage in the mental effort of thinking? Consider Levi Hutchins, an ambitious young uh, clockmaker who in 1787 invented the alarm clock. Why did he go to the trouble? He had a very specific goal. He wanted to get up before sunrise every morning, yet he faced a dilemma in accomplishing that goal. Problem solving means finding an appropriate way to attain a goal when the goal is not readily available. In this lecture, we'll cover problem solving, including some uh, blocks to problem solving and some solution strategies. We'll also take a look at how we think under uncertainty and conclude with intelligent thinking, which uh, looks at intelligence tests and some controversies over intelligence, including the uh, nature-nurture debate. A problem is a situation in which there is a goal, but no clear path to reach the goal. A well-defined problem is one with the clear specifications of the start state, where you are, goal state, where you want to be, and the processes for reaching the goal state, how to get there. An ill-defined problem is a problem lacking clear specification of the start state, goal state, or the processes for reaching the goal state. Many of the problems we face in our lives are ill-defined. There are two steps to problem solving. First, interpreting the problem and then trying to solve the problem. And we can uh, run into some roadblocks along the way, which we'll uh, take a look at. But given the complexity of the cognitive tasks we must perform, our, our brains have adapted to uh, finding ways to uh, streamline the process. That's where cognitive economy enters the picture. We're cognitive misers. We economize mentally in a variety of ways that reduce our mental effort, but that enable us to get things right most of the time. Yet, as we've also seen, cognitive economy can occasionally get us into trouble, especially when it leads us not merely to simplify, but to oversimplify. I've copied this from the uh, text just to show you um, an example of where we can have difficulty interpreting the problem in new ways. You're to connect the nine circles using four straight lines without lifting your pen or pencil from the paper or uh, retracing any of your lines. Uh, a lot of people have difficulty with this and because uh, of fixation, this is the inability to uh, think outside the box and create a new interpretation of the problem. Now, this uh, is called the nine circle problem. And uh, I don't know how you did on it, but uh, uh, did you try to keep your lines within the mental square created by the circle? If you did, you cannot solve the problem. A key ingredient of being a good uh, problem solver is to acknowledge that one does not know everything and that one's strategies and conclusions are always open to uh, revisions. Optimal problem solving may involve a certain amount of humility or the ability to admit that one is not perfect and that there may be better ways than one's tried and true methods for solving life's problems. It's easy to fall into the trap of being fixated on a particular strategy for solving a problem. Fixation is using a prior strategy and failing to look at a problem from a fresh new perspective. Functional fixedness occurs when individuals fail to solve a problem because they are fixated 
on a thing's usual functions. Solutions entail thinking about the possible novel uses of all objects in the problem environment. For example, if you need a screwdriver but don't have one, a dime could be used to serve the purpose of a screwdriver. If you've ever used a shoe to hammer a nail, you have overcome functional fix fixedness to uh, solve a problem. When we uh, overcome these uh, blocks to problem solving, we gain insight, which is a new way to interpret a problem that immediately yields the solution. Now here's an insight problem. Your instructions are uh, to look at the equation shown uh, below, which is not correct. Now to create a new equation, you can move only one matchstick, but not remove it. Only uh, Roman numerals and the uh, three operators, plus, minus, and equals, are allowed. Now this problem is easily solved when you change your perspective about arithmetic and consider the operators plus minus and equals of the equation as well as the quantities. Now this will help you see the problem from a different angle. And do you know which part of the brain is engaged with insight? Recent research indicates that the right anterior temporal lobe directly above the right ear may be such a re region. Open-mindedness means uh, being receptive to other ways of looking at things. People often do not even know that there's another side to an issue or evidence contrary to what they believe. Simple openness to other viewpoints can help keep individuals from uh, jumping to conclusions. As Socrates once said, knowing what it is you do not know is the first step to true wisdom. And overcoming blocks, some key questions you can ask yourself uh, include, is my interpretation of the problem unnecessarily constraining possible solutions? Can I use any of the objects in the problem in novel ways to solve the problem? And do I need a new type of solution strategy? Algorithms and heuristics are possible solution strategies. We can solve many problems following step-by-step uh, -step learned procedures, which we call algorithms. They come in handy for problems that depend on the same basic steps for arriving at a solution every time the uh, solution is required, such as uh, replacing the starter on a car or making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Algorithms ensure that we address all steps when we solve a problem, but they're pretty inflexible. Imagine you have an algorithm for cooking a, a mushroom omelet that includes melting some butter, but you run out of butter. Uh, you'd be stuck. As a result, you could either uh, give up or use your head to engage in a more flexible solution. Another example of an algorithm is using a multiplication correctly, which guarantees uh, you the correct solution to a multiplication problem. A heuristic is a uh, problem-solving strategy that seems reasonable given your past experiences with solving problems, uh, especially similar ones. And they may pay off with a quick, correct answer, but also may lead to no answer or an incorrect one. Heuristics are intuitive and efficient ways of solving problems and making decisions, and they are often at work when we make a decision by following a gut feeling. However, heuristics and gut feelings can lead to mistakes. There are uh, several types of heuristics. One is the anchoring and adjustment heuristic, which uses an initial estimate as an anchor, and then this anchor is adjusted up or down. An example is the uh, halo effect. When meeting a new person, your first impression forms an anchor of that person, and you may not process subsequent information about that person as fully as it should be processed. Another type is the working backward heuristic. It is uh, attempting to solve a problem by working from the goal state backward to the start state. For example, water lilies growing in a pond double in area every 24 hours. On the first day of spring, only one lily pad is on the surface of the pond. 60 days later, the entire pond is covered. On what day is the pond half covered? If you work backward with the fact that the pond is completely covered on the 60th day, you can solve this question easily. Half of the pond must be covered on the 59th day. 
The means ends analysis heuristic involves breaking down the problem into sub goals and working toward decreasing the distance to the goal state by achieving these sub goals. An example, uh, when trying to write a major term paper, students should be encouraged to break down this big task into smaller tasks that uh, when completed will result in a final large term paper. The next section of this uh, lecture considers how we think under uncertainty. We try to uh, evaluate the probability of an event or a likelihood that the event will happen. These probabilities range from zero, never happens, to one, always happens. An event with 0.5 probability of occurring is maximally uncertain because it is equally likely to occur and not occur. And looking at the uncertainty of events, we attempt to reduce uncertainty about the world by trying to find out how various events are related to each other. Tversky and Connerman noted there are two main heuristics used to make judgments about probabilities, representativeness heuristics and availability heuristics. Their research demonstrated that people often make decisions using heuristics rather than complete rational analysis. Let's take a closer look at each of these. The representativeness heuristic includes the rule of thumb for judging the probability of membership in a category by how well an object resembles that category. The more representative, the more probable. It tends to be used because the mind categorizes information automatically. For example, Bob is an opera fan who enjoys touring uh, art museums when on holiday. Growing up, he enjoyed playing chess with family members and friends. Which situation is more likely? A, Bob plays trumpet for a major symphony orchestra. Or B, Bob is a farmer. A large proportion of people will choose A because Bob's description matches the stereotype we may hold about a classical musician rather than a farmer. In reality, the likelihood of B being true is far greater because farmers make up a much larger proportion of the population. The availability heuristic is a rule of thumb that the more available an event is in our memory, the more probable it is. It suggests an event may be more prominent in memories because uh, it happened recently or because it is uh, particularly striking or vivid. For example, deaths from shark attacks are highly publicized, creating greater fear of this mode of death than of diabetes, which is a far more likely cause of death. Because airplane crashes are so visually dramatic and highly publicized by the media, they tend to be very available in our memories. This availability leads us to greatly overestimate our likelihood of dying in a plane crash. Here's another example of how we have difficulty judging probabilities. If a coin lands heads up eight times in a row, is there a greater chance of it being tails on the ninth toss? Did you commit the gambler's fallacy when answering the question on the previous slide? Well, if you answered yes, you did. The gambler's fallacy is an erroneous belief that a chance process is self-correcting in that an event that has not occurred for a while is more likely to occur. And that is why some gamblers get themselves into trouble. People believe that uh, short sequences, for example, a, a series of nine coin tosses, should reflect the long run probabilities. If a coin lands heads up eight times in a row, people think there is a greater chance of it being tails on the ninth toss. Although we use a variety of effective problem solving uh, strategies, we also face a variety of hurdles or cognitive tendencies that lead us to make errors when we're uh, testing hypotheses about how the uh, world operates. Some of these are confirmation bias, illusory correlation, belief perseverance, and person who reasoning. Confirmation bias is a tendency to seek evidence that confirms one's beliefs. Using confirmation bias is a, a clever marketing technique. While uh, marketing any product, companies will emphasize the positive points of their product, which will be proven once the uh, consumer uses that product and confirms it. The truth is there might be some negative features 
of the product that might go unnoticed by the consumer. The customer already has formed a uh, good opinion of the uh, product through uh, the marketing of the product, and all he does is collect evidence to confirm the information, so he may ignore some negative aspects of the product. Illusory correlation can be a problem too. It's the erroneous belief that two variables are related when they actually are not. It's also a tendency to focus on instances in which there seems to be a relationship between the variables in question, ignoring all disconfirming instances. A couple of examples, uh, a man holds the belief that people in urban environments tend to be rude. Therefore, when he meets someone who is rude, he assumes that the person lives in a city rather than in a rural area. Uh, a woman believes that pit bulls are inherently dangerous. When she hears of a dog attack in the news, she assumes it is a pit bull that attacked. And uh, a football fan believes that every time he wears a specific jersey, his team wins. So each time they play, he will only wear that jersey. Also being aware of these two tendencies can help us to make better choices. Belief perseverance is the tendency to cling to one's beliefs in the face of contradictory evidence. And person who reasoning is questioning a well-established finding because you know a person, one instance, who violates the established finding. For example, someone may insist that eating a steak, baked potato loaded with butter, sour cream, cheese, and salt for dinner is healthy because his grandfather did so every night for 50 years and lived to be 90 years old. This uh, last section of the lecture looks at intelligence. The first attempts to develop intelligence tests took place in late 19th century England and in early 20th century France, and they were embedded in the nature-nurture controversy. And psychologists can't agree on the precise definition of intelligence, and that's what led psychologist Edwin Boring to say that intelligence is whatever intelligence tests measure. Let's uh, examine some of the most influential attempts to define and understand intelligence. Francis Galton emphasized nature. He believed in the genetic determination of intelligence. He proposed a radical hypothesis that intelligence is the byproduct of sensory capacity. He reasoned that most knowledge first comes through the senses, especially vision and hearing. Therefore, he assumed that people with superior sensory capacities, like better eyesight, should acquire more knowledge than other people. Now, he developed tests of sensory abilities and reaction time and tested thousands of people. And he actually invented the basic mathematics behind correlational statistics. He also found that his measures were not good predictors of intelligence. Alfred Binet and uh, Theodore Simon emphasized nurture. In France, in the early part of the 20th century, they worked on the problem of mental retardation when France switched to uh, mass public education. In 1905, they developed what most uh, psychologists today regard as the first intelligence test, a diagnostic tool designed to uh, measure overall thinking ability. And they use the concept of mental age, age typically associated with a child's level of performance. Remediation was required when the mental age was less than the chronological age. Now, Binet and Simone recognized higher mental processes as part of measuring intelligence. Now, these processes uh, included reasoning, understanding, and judgment. Intelligence theorists later built on their notions. Indeed, most experts agree that whatever intelligence is, it has something to do with uh, abstract thinking. Lewis Terman revised uh, Binet and Simone's test for American school children, and he used the uh, classic intelligence quotient formula, IQ equals mental age divided by chronological age times 100. Now, when a child's mental age was assessed by the test, uh, as being greater than the uh, child's chronological age, the child's IQ was greater than 100. When a child's mental age was assessed by the test as less than the child's chronological age, the child's IQ was less than 100. 
David Weschler was the chief psychologist at Bellevue Hospital in New York City in the 1930s. Now, the Stanford Binet, as used by Tierman, was not designed to assess adult intelligence, and the IQ was particularly problematic for adults because at some point the mental age levels off, but the chronological age keeps increasing. So a person's IQ declines simply because of natural aging. So he developed his own tests, the Weschler Bellevue Scale in 1939. It was later called the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale, or the WACE, and it provides test scores for a battery of both verbal and performance tests. Some important aspects of intelligence tests that you uh, need to know about, or the psychometric properties, are standardization, reliability, and validity. Standardization is a uh, process that allows test scores to be interpreted by providing test norms. It requires that tests must be given to a large representative sample of the relevant population. Scores of this sample serve as norms for interpretation. For example, uh, Terman standardized his uh, Stanford Binet on American children of various ages. Any child's raw score could be compared with the standardization norms to calculate the child's mental age. Wessler collected standardization data for various adult age groups, and the data for each age group form a normal distribution. Now, to calculate a person's deviation IQ score, uh, Weschler compared how far the person's raw score was from the mean raw score and in terms of standard deviation units from the mean, hence the deviation IQ. To make the deviation scores resemble the IQ formula, he set the mean to 100 and the standard deviation to 15. The deviation IQ is a way of measuring how an individual's uh, generalized intelligence compares to uh, the norms for that particular group. It uses uh, statistics to uh, analyze a person's intelligence relative to their age. Deviation IQ is based on how an individual deviates from the average IQ of 100. It measures IQ as the uh, normal distribution with the average IQ being 100 with a standard deviation of plus or minus 15. Now this differs from the original way of measuring IQ, which was using a ratio score, which compared a person's mental age with their actual age. Deviation IQ scores are intended to be more accurate. Reliability is also an important psychometric property, and that's the uh, extent to which the scores for a test are consistent. That is, a person taking the test on two separate occasions should have uh, scores that are pretty close together. One way to check this is the test-retest method. The test is given twice to the same sample, and the correlation coefficient for the two sets of scores is computed. A reliable test yields a strong positive correlation. Another way to check this is alternate form reliability. Different forms of the test are given to the same sample at different times, and the correlation coefficient is computed for the performance on the two forms. And the other way is split half reliability. Reliability is determined by correlating performance of two halves of one given test. For example, odd versus even number items. On the other hand, validity refers to the extent to which a test measures what it is supposed to measure or predicts what it is supposed to predict. Content validity refers to whether the test covers the content that it is supposed to cover. And a predictive validity refers to whether the test predicts behavior that is related to what is being measured by the test. Now, it is important to note that if a test is valid, it will also be reliable. It is actually measuring what it is supposed to measure. But a test can be reliable, but not valid. Now, as I mentioned at the uh, beginning of this uh, lecture, there are some controversies about intelligence, uh, one being the definition of it and how do we measure it. Uh, one psychologist has hypothesized the existence of a single shared factor across all people that accounts for the uh, overall differences in uh, intellect.
called uh, general intelligence. Others are looking to measure uh, specific factors or aspects of, of intelligence. And it's interesting to note that in 1921, a panel of 14 American experts generated a list of uh, definitions of intelligence. Now, they didn't succeed in hammering out a single definition, but they mostly agreed that intelligence consists of the abilities to reason abstractly, uh, to learn to adapt to uh, not novel environmental circumstances, uh, to acquire knowledge, and to benefit uh, from uh, experience. So we'll kind of look at this controversy. Uh, we'll also look at the uh, role of nature versus nurture in how uh, intelligence uh, comes about. There are uh, numerous theories of intelligence out there which attempt to uh, explain what it is. Charles Spearman argued that intelligence test performance is a function of two types of factors, a G factor, general intelligence, and some S factor, uh, specific intellectual abilities, such as uh, mechanical or uh, spatial. But he believed that the G factor was more important. People who did well on one subtest usually did well on most of the subtests. And people who did poorly on one subtest usually did poorly on most of the um, subtests. Now, Spearman wasn't sure what produces individual differences in G, although he speculated that it has something to do with uh, mental energy. For Spearman, G corresponds to the uh, strength of our mental engines. Just as some cars possess more powerful engines than others, he thought some people have more powerful, more effective and efficient brains than others. They have more G. Cattell and Horn proposed two types of intelligence which have been of interest to researchers in aging. Fluid intelligence refers to the capacity to learn new ways of solving problems. We rely on our fluid intelligence the first time we try to solve a puzzle we've never seen, or the first time we try to operate uh, a type of vehicle like a motorcycle that we've never ridden. In contrast, crystallized intelligence refers to the accumulated knowledge of the world that we acquire over time. We rely on our crystallized intelligence to answer questions such as what is the capital of Italy or how many justices sit on the U.S. Supreme Court. According to Cattell and Horn, knowledge from newly learned tasks flows into our long-term memories, crystallizing into lasting knowledge. In recent decades, several prominent psychologists have argued for the existence of multiple intelligences, uh, entirely different domains of uh, intellectual skill. According to them, the concept of G is wrong, or at least uh, incomplete. Moreover, these psychologists maintain that we can't simply say that uh, Sally is smarter than Bill because there are many ways of being smart. Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences has been enormously influential in educational practice and theory over the past two decades. Gardner proposed eight different intelligences ranging from linguistic uh, and spatial to musical and interpersonal. Now he's also tentatively proposed the existence of a ninth intelligence called existential intelligence, the ability to grasp deep philosophical ideas like the meaning of life. Like Gardner, Robert Sternberg has argued that there's more to intelligence than G. Sternberg's triarchic model posits the existence of three largely distinct intelligences. Analytical intelligence, the ability to reason logically. In essence, analytical intelligence is book smarts. It's the uh, kind of intelligence we need to do well on traditional intelligence tests and do well in college. Now, according to uh, Sternberg, this form of intelligence is closely related to G, but uh, for him, it's only one component of intelligence and not necessarily the most crucial. Practical intelligence, also called tacit intelligence, uh, is the ability to solve real world problems, especially those involving uh, other people. In contrast to uh, analytical intelligence, this form of intelligence is akin to street smarts. Sternberg and his colleagues have developed measures of practical intelligence to assess how well employees and bosses perform in business settings. 
how well soldiers perform in military set settings, and so on. And finally, creative intelligence, also called creativity, is our ability to come up with uh, novel and effective answers to questions. It's the kind of intelligence we need to find new and effective solutions to problems. A uh, final theory of intelligence that uh, I'm going to cover comes from uh, Keith Stanovich. He argued that intelligence by itself is not sufficient to explain thinking and problem solving. The ability to think and act rationally, which is not assessed by standard intelligence tests, is another meaningful component. He coined a term, dysrationalia, to describe the failure to think and behave rationally despite having adequate intelligence. Well, here's a uh, table that I reproduced from the uh, textbook, which gives you a summary of uh, each of the theories that are covered. As far as where intelligence comes from, the nature versus nurture controversy has been uh, ongoing because both sides are partly right. Most contemporary psychologists believe that both heredity, nature, and environmental experiences, nurture, are important in determining intelligence. The uh, disagreement is over the relative contribution of each part to intelligence, definition of intelligence, and its origins. Twin studies, heritability, and adoption data are reviewed in the text and support the roles of both nature and nurture. Now, I want to leave you with uh, one final controversy about intelligence, and that is the Flynn effect. In the 1980s, political scientist James Flynn noticed something decidedly odd. Over time, the average IQ of the population was rising at a rate of about three points per decade, a phenomenon known as the uh, Flynn effect. The magnitude of the Flynn effect is rather mind-boggling, uh, and it suggests that on average, our IQs are a full 10 to 15 points higher than those of our grandparents. With a few exceptions, uh, most researchers agree that this effect is the result of unidentified environmental influences on IQ because it's unlikely that uh, genetic changes would account for such rapid rises in IQ over brief time periods. 